You're listening to Language Nerds Do Earth, the podcast about linguistics, culture, travel, and how they're all connected. Now, it's time for your language nerd hosts. One in China, one in Spain, it's Patrice and Rachel. Hello everyone, I'm Patrice. And I'm Rachel. And welcome back to Language Nerds to Earth. This is our sixth episode. We're really excited and thanks for joining us. So this week we're going to talk about body language and different body cues that are different from culture to culture. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we have a lot of stuff about this. It's kind of funny because like, I mean, podcasts aren't visual, right? But uh, <laughs> body language is all visual. So yeah. uh, you might be thinking... How? How are we going to do that? But We're going to try our best. Exactly. <laughs> I have an update for everyone who cares or who doesn't care <laughs> about my Maciel situation. So back in episode three, we were talking about spring festivals. And I went on a bit of a rant about how much I love these green pickled plums that I used to eat in Korea. I found the green plums here in China. Uh, mm. Yeah, it's very exciting. So I, <laughs> I was going through the grocery store, and I was like, "Ooh, I like these grapes." And then I looked to the left of the grapes, and I was like, "Oh my god!" I had like a mini heart attack in the <laughs> middle of the grocery store, and I, I found the green plums. And the next day, my husband and I went to the store to get a big pickling jar and some sugar. And so I've got some plums of pickling in the closet right now. All right. So yeah. just six more months and you'll have pickled plums. <laughs> yeah. So I'll, don't worry. Don't worry about the plums. I promise to keep you guys updated on the situation. <laughs> we'll have like weekly plum updates. Yeah. <laughs> the sugar <laughs> is starting to liquefy. It's so exciting. <laughs> For example... So, um, yeah, uh, before we get into body language, though, we do have a, a bit of language news for you this week. And this week, I learned about why we speak English instead of Spanish. So do you want to start us off on that, Rachel? Sure. Yeah, it's not so much, let's say, like groundbreaking news, mm -hmm. but it's something interesting to think about, uh, especially since... English is becoming every day, I think, even more of the kind of global language. Mm -hmm. And just thinking about kind of how did that come about and why is that? Um, so we know that the Spanish were the first to colonize in the Americas mm -hmm. and the English were a little bit behind on that. Yeah, exactly. And Apparently, it all really comes down to this one night in 1588, this one naval battle when the British defeated the Spanish Armada in the English Channel. So uh, we have a special guest. He is my husband. <laughs> <laughs> and I talked to him about it yesterday. He majored in history, and he's really good at kind of putting history into an everyday man's perspective. Mm -hmm. He's good at telling stories. So, so yeah, let's listen to what he had to say. Okay, so I talk to you first. Talk first or you talk first? Oh, yeah. I just kind of wanted to get a historian's perspective on what happened. I'm finally <laughs> putting that degree to use. Yay! Yay! Okay. Hey, so my name is Seth. Uh, I'm, I'm an Aquarius. <laughs> I like long, long walks on the beach. Yeah. Um... My favorite color is orange. <laughs> um, yeah, you wanted to talk about the Spanish Armada. Yes. There was a momentous occasion when um, the Brits overtook the Spaniards. And uh, yeah. I, and, I, and you're really good at kind of explaining history. So. Oh, I, thank you. Yeah, sure. So basically, you're right. It was pretty momentous. This was like the end of the 16th century, so like 1580s, 1590s. Uh -huh. uh, the Spanish were essentially the naval superpower of the world. 
They had colonies all over the place, and they were getting really mad at England because this was also the golden age of privateering, huh. a.k.a. Pirates of the Caribbean timeline. Uh-huh. So you got Sir Francis Drake uh, in the English corner, <laughs> and uh, Philip II of Spain in the other, and he's getting real mad that he's losing all of his New World loot to these uh, scurvy sea dogs, if you will. (laughs) So he mounts an all-out naval attack on Britain to, one, show them who's boss, basically revenge for all the the pirating in the Caribbean, Uh, two, because he wants to put Spain back in top dog position, and three, Spain is Catholic, and England is not. That's like a whole other story. So they're like, we're going to do this for God as well. And what ends up happening is that they get blindsided by a naval assault in the English Channel. And almost all of their 130 ship armada is either sunk or scuttled. So the remaining ships try to make it back to Spain. Mm -hmm. And as fate would have it, this maelstrom hits. And basically takes out the rest of those ships, too. Ah, okay. Which essentially opens the door wide open for England to become the new naval superpower of the world. Hmm. And as history shows us, that's exactly what they did. And then they started putting colonies all over the planet. And that's why the sun never set on the English Empire for how many, however many years. Okay. What I learned also was... It had something to do with the wind in the English Channel? Yeah, so it's a notoriously dangerous body of water. There's a lot of weird weather that goes on around there. And it was kind of a gamble to have a naval battle in that particular spot. Mm -hmm. And the English capitalized on it, and the Spanish were at the short end of the stick for that one. Yeah, what I saw was that the winds were in the English favor, and so... The Spaniards had to fight really hard to sail upstream to attack. And then once they were really close, the English lit eight ships on fire, basically, and just set them downwind toward the Spanish ships. And that was the mm-hmm. big the big thing that really changed the tides. Yeah, 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 you're right. That was, like, part of the English plan was that they also used, like, Dutch ships to help them out. Oh, okay. Because um, they didn't really have um, a fleet at that time not yet right so yeah they had like this fire ship attack and so the escape route that the remaining spanish ships used was like to go further north into the atlantic Mm -hmm. was was where all the weather got even worse Mm -hmm. and that's where they lost even more ships okay interesting so really our entire history boils down to this one weird weather day on the English Channel. Yeah, um, this was definitely, like, something of real significance. Mm -hmm. But uh, a lot of of times in history you can look back and see all these very powerful mainland Europe empires try to take over the British Isles and it not work out. Mm -hmm. Something about those islands, man. That's interesting. Huh. Some kind of uh, supernatural force has kept it in their hands, maybe, for a really long time. Or, I mean, Caesar tried it. Uh Uh-huh. Spanish tried it. Yeah. The Danes tried it. Normans tried it. Mm Mm-hmm. Good. (laughs) (laughs) All right, cool. Thank you. That was just my two bits. Yeah, (laughs) I like it. Okay, so, yeah, basically, the reason that the main language in the world is English is because the Spanish were defeated by the English on this fateful night in 1588. Yeah, and basically that kind of just changed the course of events. Mm. Who had the dominance in the world after that? The English slowly increased their dominance while the Spanish... I think there was a lot going on at home as Mm -hmm. well in Spain um, that contributed to that as well yeah and, that's true but it's like looting all the pirates mm-hmm. um, destroyed ships uh, looting mm-hmm. so they lost a lot of their wealth 
and eventually they would come to lose pretty big parts of the empire. Mm-hmm. While the English, I think, held on a little bit longer. Cool. Well, thank you, Seth, for your story. Yes, thank you. Very insightful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cool. Well, let's go ahead and dig into our body language episode. Awesome. So first we're going to start by talking about some obscene hand gestures that you can find in different cultures. Um, Then we're going to talk a little bit about smiling and to smile or not to smile. (laughs) And finally, we're going to talk about personal space Mm -hmm. and how that also is a construct of culture. Yeah, so first we'll warm up with some obscene hand gestures. That's a great place to start. Yeah. (laughs) Set the tone. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Okay, well, first of all, in the U.S. we use a lot of thumbs up to mean as the universal, oh, good signal, right? Mm -hmm. I actually use it a lot here, like, good job. Um, yeah. But in, in Iran and a lot of other countries, it actually means up yours. So. <laughs> yeah. If you think about it, yeah, it, it makes sense. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So, in France, Southern Europe, and Latin America, um, you might see kind of an upward jerk of the forearm. Mm-hmm. Um using the other hand on top of the bicep or something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, with kind of like the like fist. fist facing in mm-hmm. towards your face. Yeah. And that's kind of like the middle finger. Yeah, like a big middle finger, basically. Yeah. Yeah, and number three, we have the corna, which is known as the rock and roll symbol in the U.S. Um, mm-hmm. But you have to be careful where you use the corna because in Colombia, uh, Spain, Portugal, and the Baltics, apparently it means your wife is a whore. So. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Actually, that just made me think of something. Um, mm-hmm. When you do the symbol with your hands, uh-huh. you've got like your index finger and your pinky finger out uh-huh. up. And uh, I'm pretty sure my old roommate told me that you do the symbol... To talk about somebody cheating as well. Ah, okay. You say something like, um, giving someone the horns is to cheat on someone. Oh, like like a devil, maybe? It's like, okay. oh yeah, putting horns means to cheat. Poner los cuernos, but it's widespread in Spanish culture. So, that kind of makes sense, I guess, if you're cheating on someone. Okay, so connecting your middle and ring finger with your thumb... And then pointing your index finger and pinky finger up to the sky uh, is the symbol for the devil, basically, in Spanish culture, which means infidelity. Mm-hmm. And dar los cuernos yeah. literally translates poner to... Los uh, poner los yeah. To put the horns. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, I don't know if I'm drawing a connection that's not there, but... Oh, uh, um, no. Yeah, it kind of makes never. sense. So, number four. So, basically... If you picture a peace sign, so your index and your middle finger up, except with the back of your hand facing out, Mm -hmm. that is basically another up yours. (laughs) In Australia, other Commonwealth countries, and Korea. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, my boyfriend said that it's, like, kind of with an upward motion, like... Yeah, yeah. Seth does it sometimes when he's mock cursing me because <laughs> it doesn't really have any meaning to us so yeah. instead of actually giving me the middle finger he'll do that apparently it's a thing though okay yeah. cool so number five we have the okay sign which i think it's really funny because you know we use it not only in the u.s but it's also the universal symbol for when you're scuba diving and you want to tell your partner that everything's okay ah okay but in brazil and germany it means you're a part of the body that is a hole in the end of the digestive tract. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're an a-hole. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I feel like I've seen Germans do that too. They'll be like, you know, they'll whistle. Have you heard That's that? That's true. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, and I think that's pretty a pretty famous one. Yeah. That one is like something to not do everywhere. <laughs> yeah, it's notorious. Yeah, <laughs> this one was really interesting. Crossed fingers. Mm. So I think you and I would do this for good luck. Right. Or hoping something happens. Mm-hmm. Cross your fingers. In Vietnam, apparently, if you're looking at someone while doing it, it resembles female genitals. Yeah. And what does that mean? It's basically the same thing as the middle finger in the West. Okay. If you do this, the person you're talking to will be completely shocked that you've used it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Like, if, you, if you're talking to somebody and instead of saying good luck, they give you the middle finger, like, I would be... <laughs> I guess I would be pretty shocked. Yeah. (laughs) Okay, so next we have number seven, beckoning. So, you know, in the U.S., like, beckoning would be pointing at your index finger and curving it with an upward pointing fist with the other fingers. And that's kind of, that's kind of normal in the U.S. Come here, especially for kids. But in Asia, if you do it, it's very offensive because it's usually used in Asia just for dogs. So if you do a beckoning, it shows that you think that the person you're talking to is a submissive inferior, Mm -hmm. which I think there's a lot of that in Asian culture. Yeah, it's a lot about insulting someone by showing your superiority. Yeah. It seems like. Do you ever call people like that, though? No. No, I don't think I do. (laughs) Yeah, unless like I was trying to be like cheeky with somebody, I might do it. Yeah. I guess like. Come here, I want to show you something. I have some chocolate hidden under this pile or <laughs> something like that. Yeah, I wonder if it's going to maybe go a little bit out of fashion. Yeah, but that makes sense. I have associations with just like kind of over the top come hither. Right, mm. sexual. Yeah, and so I don't think I would normally use that one if I wanted to call someone over I'd use my whole hand or yeah something. yeah same which actually you know in the U.S. when you say come here your mm-hmm. hand is facing up but in Asia it's pointing down and ah. you do like a like a wave same kind of wave you do when you say come here in the U.S. but if mm-hmm. you do it especially in Southeast Asia like if you're beckoning a cab you point your arm up and then you wave your hand up and down with your palm pointing down and same okay. if you're talking to somebody, if you want to say, like, come here, you point your palm down toward the ground, and then you wave your hand from the wrist. Oh, interesting. I kind of like it, actually. Hmm. I've adopted it, like, come here, come here. But it's something that only Seth understands. <laughs> so <laughs> when we were back in the U.S., I would do it to him in public, and it probably looked, like, really weird. <laughs> well, cool. Yeah. Um, the next one we have is the... How do you say this? Mutsa? Yeah. And apparently this is one of the oldest um, symbols. Mm -hmm. So this would be in Greece, Pakistan, and many parts of Africa. Mm -hmm. So if you extend your fingers and your palm straight towards somebody, kind of like in their face Mm -hmm. or so. Yeah. Especially if it's accompanied by harsh words, then that's very disrespectful. Mm Mm-hmm. I like this one because of the origin. Yeah. So it comes from when people were being punished and maybe they'd be tied up to something. People would come put like dirt or feces or ash or something in their faces Mm -hmm. and rub it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it comes from when uh, people would be punished in the public square and they'd be tied to something. It's so interesting. When I do that motion, my fingers are very, or like overextended and Mm -hmm. I don't know I feel like I've seen this before what do you think yeah I don't know I'm trying to picture it like it reminds me more of actually like a curse on you yeah 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 yeah. talking to somebody and pointing your palm at them with overextended fingers yeah it's kind of like it does feel aggressive yeah yeah exactly that's so interesting yeah I like that one too Mm -hmm. okay and the last one we have is called the kudis and you might have seen this one before, maybe not directed toward you, but it's when the thumb comes off of the back of your two front teeth, and it's used in Pakistan and India, and it means, apparently, screw you and your whole family. (laughs) 
Yes, it always makes me think of Shakespeare. Ah, yeah, yeah. yeah. In Romeo and Juliet, um, I will bite my thumb at them. I think it was actually a common insult in England at the huh. time as well. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Well, I think we're ready to move on to smiling. Hmm. <laughs> I love this. This is so interesting. In countries where there's been a long history of immigration, smiling tends to be more common. Hmm. So this article from The Atlantic was talking about how the U.S. has 82 main source countries, so immigrants coming in from 82 different places in the world. And so that's a really high number, and we have Hmm. a long history of immigration. And so if you think about it, people wouldn't be able to communicate with their neighbors very easily like you see somebody and you don't know what language they're going to speak especially like in the beginning of the 20th century there's a high possibility that somebody that you saw wasn't going to be able to speak your language right so the only way that they could communicate was through smiling just like hello i'm not a threat (laughs) yeah really interesting though I don't know if you've experienced this when you travel, like feeling too smiley or... Mm-hmm. I remember when I went to Russia. Uh-huh. Um, so I went with my choir to Russia. And part of our cross-cultural briefing before we went was like, don't smile so much because Russian people tend to think that you're insincere or right. you're not a serious person if you're smiling so much. Yeah. Yeah. So this article even mentioned Russia. They said in instable countries like Russia, over smiling can be seen as foolish. Mm -hmm. And one Finland Reddit user actually said, when a stranger smiles at you, you either assume that he's a drunk, B insane or C American. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I love that. Yeah, we like to smile. Yeah, me too. I remember going to a um like a group where everybody speaks German when I was living in Charleston. Mm-hmm. And so there were a lot of people who came from Germany and I remember talking to some of them at first when they had just arrived and I'm a very smiley person as an American. Yeah. Yes. And I'm a very excited person, especially when I'm speaking another language. Like, yeah, I'm doing it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I remember talking to them and like smiling a lot. And I felt like I was being really aggressive from just from their reaction. Oh, okay. I think. And then over time, they learned like, OK, this is what Americans do. And they kind of relaxed. But it usually took a few months Interesting. Mm -hmm. And how do you feel, like, in the reverse? So we obviously come from a more smiley culture, but how do Mm -hmm. you feel if someone that you're talking to is very serious or stone-faced? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know about you, but I tend to worry that I've done something to offend them. Mm -hmm. Or, yeah, if I'm talking to somebody... And I'm smiling and they're not smiling. I tend to smile more (laughs) to get them to smile. Yeah. And that probably doesn't help. (laughs) Yeah, that's a good point, though. That it feels very uneasy. um, Yeah. When it's like, why aren't you smiling? Like, we're just having a pleasant conversation or (laughs) um, you work in the service industry. um, Right. Like, you should be smiling. Do you get that a lot in Spain? Yeah, actually. Of course, the service is not the same outside of the United States. <laughs> right. Um, and in Spain, I find that it's very kind of like to the point. Let's get this interaction done quickly. And there's not the kind of, I guess, like, I don't want to say like relationship building, but, you know, like mm-hmm. maybe teasing, like, how's your day going? You know, right, right. There's not like small talk like we have in the U.S. Yeah, it's like, usually. what can I get? F- what do you want? Right. You say it, and then they go away, and they bring it to you. And that's it. Yeah. <laughs> I remember being in Spain, too, and same in Germany. Like, okay, so this transaction has happened. Okay, now, now you leave. <laughs> <laughs> so people in more diverse countries smile to bond socially. 
Whereas in more homogenous countries, especially in Asia,、mm-hmm. I had no idea about this, but a lot of times a smile is used to establish superiority over somebody. Right. So, <laughs> did you know that? Have you no. Heard that before? We might have talked about it in my cross cultural communication class, but that was years ago.、Uh-huh. And、yeah. I guess it makes sense. It talked about how a lot of those kinds of cultures are more hierarchical.、Mm-hmm. So that kind of keeps in place the hierarchy somehow. Yeah. Yeah. Compared with Canada or the United States, those countries tend to smile a lot less and for different reasons. Right. Another thing that was interesting was so there was a study. Basically, they pulled people from 32 different countries, college students to be specific, about how much they valued different emotions, specifically、mm-hmm. high energy and excitement versus more low energy emotions and calm, if that makes sense. Yeah. And so, what they found is that there's a direct correlation between the countries who valued. High energy and excitement, and the smiles of government officials. So the one that valued at the highest was the U.S.、Mm-hmm. Yeah. Not very surprisingly. Right. So basically, they quantified the different muscles in the face, and the most excited smiles for government officials were in the U.S. I thought that was interesting because I've heard people say before, Americans they always need to be happy. Like it's okay to、mm. not be happy sometimes, you know. Yeah. Apparently, when Walmart opened in Germany, they had to like tweak their store policy because usually in Walmart, you know, their corporate policy is to make sure that you smile at the customers, but、mm-hmm. the customers in Germany kept interpreting it as flirting. Yeah. <laughs> so they、uh, they had to change that, but. Walmart didn't do so well in Germany anyway. In the end, yeah, they ended up leaving, right? Yeah, <laughs> people didn't like getting all of their stuff from one place. Yeah, <laughs> or yeah, maybe not such, not that kind of quality. Yeah,、mm-hmm. yeah, Germans are pretty informed buyers, and they definitely demand high quality. So.、Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I thought it was interesting too about when McDonald's opened in Russia.、Uh-huh. Basically. They had to teach Russian workers how to smile,、yep. and it was like, why are we, why are we smiling? <laughs> kind of like the thing about the service thing, like why、yeah. are we smiling? So they had to kind of break it down, like you take someone's money and you smile and you say thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That must have been a little painful for them, I imagine. Yeah, and I can't imagine that it would go over. Too well either in、customers. that context. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It seems a little backwards. Like, why not adapt? Yeah. The policy to the cultural context instead of vice yeah, versa. Yeah, I agree.、Uh, apparently, Disneyland had to do the same thing in Paris when they opened. Okay. Because they taught their French employees, "This is Disney, where we're happy," <laughs> and the French、mm. are. Known to be a little bit melancholy. Maybe yeah. There's definitely also more of a less of a front. Definitely. Let's say, I think a lot of times we put up a front like a happy、yeah. face, and it doesn't matter if you're having a good day or a bad day. You should at least try to look right, happy. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Happy is normal. If you're not happy, there's something wrong.、Mm-hmm. That's our that's our culture. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah.、Huh. Yeah. I think that's pretty much everything we've got on smiling. Yeah. So it it's gonna be interesting if you've traveled or if you plan on traveling, try to pay attention、yeah. to that. And if you have any interesting stories, we'd love to hear them. So you could yeah, send them in. Yeah, please. You can comment on an episode, or you could even send us a little a little voice note. To our Gmail, that'd be really cool. We could play it like at the beginning of next episode, maybe. It's like a follow-up. Yeah. If anyone has, yeah, if anyone has any stories, that'd be cool to、Definitely. hear from me. I think the main rule of thumb when you're traveling is just try to copy other people. Like, yeah. If you go somewhere,、um, and you don't want to seem like a bull in a china shop or 
like stick out like a sore thumb, right? Yeah. Uh, just do what everybody else is doing. If there's a lot of smiling, you smile too. If there's no smiling, mm -hmm. uh, try to keep it down. <laughs> yeah. And another thing that we could learn from, I think, is talking about personal space and yeah. what's comfortable to different people is not the same. Uh huh. That's so interesting. So yeah, it's crazy. So basically, there's the idea of proxemics. Uh -huh. I don't know if you've heard of it, but proxemics was introduced by an anthropologist by the name of Edward T. Hall in the 1960s. Okay. And so he studied a lot about animal behavior and defining territory and personal boundaries. Okay. So basically, he came up with four different types of space that we need. The first type would be an intimate space. You let your, let's say, your close friends, your family, your lover, etc. within that distance. Mm -hmm. And so for people in the West, when I say West, I guess I mean Northern Europe and maybe the United States, Canada, something like that. Mm -hmm. It's about 6 to 18 inches, so that's about 15 to 45 centimeters. Mm -hmm. And that's really where you feel most vulnerable, I guess. Hmm. Um, so only close people are allowed in that space. Okay. The next one is called the personal zone, and it's between 18 inches and 48 inches, something like that, which is about... 46 centimeters to 1.2 meters. Okay. And that's the distance that we typically stand from each other at parties or social gatherings. Yeah. Assuming that the, it's not like a frat party where there's no space, you know. Right. And Or the music isn't so loud that you have to scream into each other's ear. Exactly. Right. Like at a casual social event or a work a work party, something like that. Yeah. And uh, then there's the social zone, which is between four and twelve feet, <laughs> which is about one point two to three point six meters. It's <laughs> so far away. It's very far, yeah. That's the distance that you would stand from strangers uh -huh. or uh, either people that you just met or one article talked about people doing repairs at your house mm -hmm. or the mailman, something like that. Yeah. You're not really close to them. Right. I feel like in the U.S. we're very well known for having enormous personal bubbles, right? So even mm -hmm. in the grocery store, sometimes somebody walks past you and they'll be like, oh, sorry. It's like you're not. Yeah. <laughs> it's so weird. Like we're allowed to walk past each other. Yeah. And our aisles anyway are huge to begin with. Right. <laughs> so the final one is the public zone, which is over 12 feet or over 3.6 meters. Oh, yeah. So when we address a bigger group of people, this is the comfortable distance that we choose to stand. Oh, Okay. So did the article talk about how the zones get smaller in different places? Oh, no. So this is like a Northern European, uh, U.S. Canadian type distance. Okay. okay. So it does get shorter. So, for example, maybe Southern Europe. So Italians have a shorter friend zone. So let's say what would be comfortable for us would be... 12 inches away or well I guess in a personal zone 18 inches away a foot 46 centimeters you know a good distance a good mm -hmm. arm's length for Italian cultures would be much more in your face yeah and it feels similar to the smiling thing sometimes it feels like flirting right one of the articles mentioned an Italian couple that moved to Australia and they joined a social club and all the women thought that the man was um hitting on them uh, okay and all the men thought that the woman was also like sexually available <laughs> <laughs> and it was just a difference of how comfortable they were with their space that is hilarious yeah <laughs> i mean kind of inconvenient for the italian couple i'm sure like just probably annoying for them like i'm just yeah. trying to have a conversation but yeah i like the note you put in about the japanese waltz yeah. It's kind of like that. <laughs> yeah. 
and maybe I haven't had this experience per se, but I've had the urge. So like, this is called the Japanese waltz. Japanese personal bubble is much smaller than the American personal bubble. The Japanese, when they're having a conversation, they just need about 10 inches of space, which is still within the intimate zone. Yeah. If a Japanese person is in a conversation with an American, they might continually be moving forward, trying to get within conversation zone, while the American moves back to give themselves more of a personal bubble. Yeah. That's really funny. I like that term a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Have you experienced that? This Japanese wall? I feel like it happens in China, too. Mm -hmm. People will get really close to me when they're talking, and I often feel the urge to back away, but I also have learned to not listen to that part of myself. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And, yeah, try to turn it off and be like, okay, this is just a normal conversation. It doesn't necessarily feel like flirting. It just feels like a bit of an invasion, but I think that's just because... My personal bubble is a little bit bigger. I think over time I've become more used to not needing as much personal space because I've lived abroad a lot, but I still Mm -hmm. feel it for sure. Yeah, it feels uncomfortable when someone wants to have a conversation right next to your face. Yeah. It's like, okay, we could just have a a little bit more space between us and I would be Yeah. Do you feel it in Spain too? Not so much. I was trying to think. Have I had this experience? I definitely have, but I feel like even maybe I've been on the other end. Yeah. Like been moving forward and someone moving back, yeah. moving back. <laughs> it feels and it feels awkward. It's like, oh yeah. um, do I smell bad? Yeah. <laughs> but some people just I think that's more of a just an unusually large personal space. Yeah. Yeah, that could be. And me wanting to just be in, like, the normal personal space. (laughs) Can you hear me from over there? (laughs) Yeah, we're standing four feet apart. (laughs) But another thing that's different is the distance between men and men Uh or women and women. Uh So these are the basic guidelines, but for two women, the distance would be closer. Oh, that makes sense for sure. And for Two men, the distance would be wider. So you could see, like, two men standing pretty far apart and, like, having a conversation. (laughs) Whereas women are normally more comfortable, I think, being next to each other, being closer. Yeah. I wonder if there's a bit of a difference. I mean, this is kind of going off on a tangent, but... Go for it. (laughs) I wonder if there's a difference between gay men Mm -hmm. and... Because I feel like I, I can definitely stand closer to my gay male friends and have a conversation with them than I can with my straight male friends. Okay, yeah. Do you feel that way too? That makes sense. Yeah, for sure. I think it's more of a comfort thing, actually. Yeah, Um, yeah. Like, how do you perceive that person? How do you feel around that person? Yeah. And you don't usually stand closer to somebody if there's, like, the risk of the opposite sex or whatever. If there's a risk Um, of feeling like you're flirting with them? Exactly. Yeah. okay. Yeah, that's true. I would guess. And so we also found some rules for the behavior of when you're in a crowded place. (laughs) So the classic is like when you're in an elevator. Uh Uh-huh. Basically, there are these kind of unspoken rules that everyone abides by, pretty much. So you make like a neutral face. Right. Most of the time looking at the numbers, watching that Uh or kind of looking down at the ground or if you're on your phone like looking at your phone or a book or something and that's because like everyone is in each other's personal or intimate space oh cool and so it feels uncomfortable um to be that close especially with strangers um that you're not speaking with or even if you're with a friend have you ever been in an elevator with only like a friend or somebody uh-huh. and it still gets awkward. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, just because you feel like you're in an enclosed space and I don't know, as an American I feel pretty uncomfortable with silence. Mm-hmm. I feel like I need to fill the silence with something exciting. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it can get awkward. Like, okay, now we're still waiting for the elevator to move. Yeah. And usually if you're in a group, I think you don't talk 
if you're with somebody, you don't talk to them yeah. because everyone else might hear your conversation or might be put off, I guess, right. by... Yeah, definitely. Have you ever read that yeah. list of, like, it used to go around, I feel like, 10 years ago on the internet. It was, like, things that you should do in an elevator. And a lot of totally inappropriate things, like you get on a crowded elevator, the door closes behind you, but you look away from the door with your back facing the door. Oh, yeah. And it was, like... I'm sure you're wondering why I've gathered you all here today. <laughs> yeah, I do remember that. Yeah, I don't remember what else was on it, but it was really funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and some other places that you're forced to be in close personal contact with people that you normally wouldn't mm-hmm. be. Which goes to another point. You said in Asia, how would you say that people's personal or intimate space is oh it's uh definitely smaller yeah so there's a lot of difference about crowded conditions Mm -hmm. so obviously in asia people are used to being around a lot a lot of other people Uh and even let's say in these like northern european north american countries there's difference between if you live in a city if you were raised in a city Mm -hmm. versus in a more rural area People who are used to more space need more space as well. Oh, yeah, definitely. I can totally see that. Especially, I was telling Rachel, I went to Hong Kong yesterday, and I've decided I really don't like Hong Kong. Like, it is way too no. crowded. <laughs> yeah. Hong Kong is so cool. Yeah, I'm sure it is. I live in China, so it's not like I'm not used to crowds. <laughs> but Hong Kong is another level, and I am... I'm not used to it at all. Yeah. Um, I have a few more points about my experience, just like in general. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you saw this in Korea, but in Asia, you definitely don't point at somebody with your finger. You expose an open palm to the sky and you don't point at anybody or anything. If you're showing which way to go, you point with your hand outstretched. Mm Mm-hmm. Right. One of my favorites was um, the lips. Oh, yeah. Pointing with the lips. Yeah. So in Filipino and Native American and Latin American cultures, people sometimes use their lips to point. <laughs> yeah, that's so interesting. And yeah, and I realized, yeah, my boyfriend does this <laughs> all the time. That one over there. He said he's from uh, Venezuela. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. He's from Venezuela. <laughs> yeah, that's really cool. I'm sure I've seen that before, too. Even from, like, Germans, maybe. But Germans do a lot of lip pursing in general. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's true. Um, bowing. We didn't even get into bowing. Maybe we can do, like, an entire episode on bowing. <laughs> but in Thailand, for example, you bow with your hands in a straight prayer position, so without your fingers clasped. Mm-hmm. And then the higher your hands are in front of your body... Mm -hmm. the more respect you're conveying when they're at a temple. Or the king is also really high up on the forehead, at least. Okay. And then, like, normal, everyday conversation, you're talking to somebody, and you'll put them at your heart. Okay. Like, greeting somebody in a in a restaurant or whatever. It's called the why, the greeting. Mm -hmm. And so, like, I would say, Sawadika! And I would bow with my hands at my heart, even if I bring them up to my chin. That's more respectful. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, I remember bowing a lot in Korea. Oh, yeah. Everybody bows in Korea. Yeah, and you can't help really but do it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It rubs off really fast. You feel like a total dweeb if you don't bow in Korea. Yeah, that's true. Which was weird for me coming back to Asia because in China there's very little bowing that happens. Oh, really? Um, Yeah. So for the first two weeks, I would always bow to somebody when I saw them. And I think it was weird for them. (laughs) Like, why is this white person bowing? (laughs) Uh, It was kind of extinguished with the Cultural Revolution, so. Okay. (laughs) One thing that I almost forgot about that's super important is eye contact. Yeah. That's where I was going to go next, too. Yeah. So as Americans... We make a lot of eye contact, direct eye contact, and apparently 
especially Spain, Greece, and Arab countries, eye contact is also really important. Mm -hmm. But then in a lot of different cultures, it's seen as aggressive or disrespectful to give too much eye contact. So people look away. Yeah. And let's say you come from either one of these different cultures when you're experiencing the other one, for example... Mm -hmm. us when we're talking to someone who's not making eye contact it's like uh, are you paying attention or is this boring right or yeah it's so interesting to me how much that varies because it seems so natural in the U.S. Mm -hmm. to want to make eye contact with people but I know in Saudi Arabia women and men who aren't closely related or married aren't allowed to make eye contact Mm -hmm. with each other Or, like, the woman isn't allowed to look at the man directly in the eye. So when I was teaching Saudis in in Charlotte, shout out to my Saudi students. I love you guys. (laughs) Uh, You've been, I remember this one student who was a woman, seems, like, almost Americanized. Yeah. But I remember watching her with Saudi men, and she would kind of look away when they were talking and that's just what you do. And I remember thinking, oh, that's, I don't really think of her as from somewhere else because she's, her English was so good. Mm-hmm. But, but yeah, eye contact is another episode possibly yeah. too. <laughs> yeah. In Germany, you don't, you don't cross your fingers, you press your thumbs. Yeah. Like a politician. Yeah. Um, Bianca, our German exchange student, uh-huh. I remember she said something one time it was either to me or my mom for good luck she was like I'm pressing my thumbs for you and it wasn't a an expression that we were familiar with and we were like what she's like I'm pressing my thumbs like good luck yeah ich drück dir die Daumen yeah ah okay so we were like yeah crossing your fingers I got it okay yeah exactly it's so interesting all these things seem universal yeah not at all (laughs) yeah totally okay yeah so we have covered a lot Mm -hmm. there's way more out there but i know it's so it's so broad we We have have limited time so exactly (laughs) all right are you ready for our lost in translation moment so ready let's do it Um, So this is a submission that we have from Jasmine in Colorado, and she wrote to us. She said, I was talking in Spanish to one of my Puerto Rican friends, and I said, es un miraculo. So the word miracle in Spanish is a false friend. Mm -hmm. Uh, a, A lot of words in English you can translate from English into Spanish by just kind of like making it sound Spanish and then adding an O, but... The Spanish word for miracle is milagro. Mm -hmm. So instead of saying es un milagro, she said es un miraculo. She was trying to say it's a miracle. And her friend looked shocked. And she said, ¿Qué me dices? (laughs) What did you tell me? And I said, es un miraculo. And the friend said, mira qué. (laughs) <laughs> and I said, miraculo. And the friend said, mira a mi culo. <laughs> so that's when I realized that was not the right word. And I explained that I was not looking at her butt, and I meant milagro. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, um, do you want to tell us about culo? Sure. Um, <laughs> culo means but or maybe a little stronger than that yeah mira means look so Mm -hmm. mira culo yeah and in spain culo is a very normal word for butt whereas in latin america it's like a sexualized word for butt right so so that's why her puerto rican friend was scandalized (laughs) That's so funny. Yeah, you gotta be careful with milagro. <laughs> yeah, that's very different. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> I was reading this and I was thinking it was like a name or something. Mir- 
Miraculo or something. Oh, yeah, that was my note to myself, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so thank you so much, Jasmine, for sending that in. Yes, that was super funny. Awesome. All right. Uh, yes, if you want to submit your own Lost in Translation story, please send us either an email in our contact section of the website, or you can uh, send us a voice memo to languagenerdsdoearth at gmail.com. Perfect. And we would love to hear your stories and be able to share them on the mm-hmm. show. So, yeah, I think that's all we have for this week. So. Yeah. If you have any of your own experiences with body language um, or you have a comment on something that we said, we would be so happy to hear from you. Yeah. And follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Pinterest. Yeah. (laughs) So make sure to check that out uh, for more interesting updates. Yeah. And please don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes. Reviews really help people find us. So when more people review us, that increases our visibility. And the more visible we are on iTunes, the more people will listen and learn about how great our world is. So really, by listening, you are contributing to world peace. Hashtag reviews for world peace. And eventually, I won't give that spiel. I'll just say reviews for world peace. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, and be sure, if you like this episode tell your friends about it Mm -hmm. and yeah we would love to again hear from you about your different experiences yeah definitely you can also subscribe to our blog if you want to hear more about our experiences traveling and living abroad we usually write a post per week most recently i released a post about a delicious hot pot experience that i had here in china yeah that looks so cool (laughs) yeah it was so good We've gone back like three times since then. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah. Addicted. Yeah, we'll probably go back today, if I'm being totally honest. <laughs> and I will be writing a post about pickling my plums, so anybody <laughs> who needs to know about that, don't worry. I'll have more information soon. <laughs> okay, well thank you so much for listening, everybody. Yes, thank you so much. Have a great day. Day, evening, night, Mm -hmm. wherever you are. All right. All right. Bye. Bye.